Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video we're going to look at the case of Sandra Melgar who was sent away in 2017. This story takes us to Houston where Sandra Melgar was married to Jim Melgar for 32 years and when celebrating their 32nd wedding anniversary they went out for dinner, had a nice lovely time, came home and Sandra can't remember much after that. She woke up the next day tied up and locked in her closet, and Jim, her husband, was… well. But was this a bizarre cover-up, a staged scene, or is Sandra truly innocent as many believe her to be? This case, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, there are many things in it which could lead you to believe one thing or the other. So, let's get into it. Jamie Jim Melgar was born in Guatemala, emigrating to the United States when he was three years old. His family settled in Houston, where Sandra, Sandy, McCulloch lived. Jim and Sandy became high school sweethearts, graduating in 1978, and they got married in 1980. Jim ended up as a clackety clackety computer programmer. Sandra became a licensed vocational nurse. Now, Sandra had a number of health issues. She was riddled with problems, including arthritis, epilepsy, lupus, and hip problems. She would actually need hip replacements. And with all this, she ended up quitting her job. That's when herself and Jim set up their own business, doing a bit of DL medical billing and coding. Uh, you know yourself. And over the years, they would get into real estate, owned a few rental homes. Jim and Sandy would have a daughter, Elizabeth, Liz, born in 1985. The family also joined the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is good for them, a strict enough group though, I understand. Now, people close to Jim and Sandy knew them as a, you know, a very close couple, loving, friendly, would never fight at all. The police though, uh, would have a different opinion when we get to what we're gonna get to. On the 22nd of December, 2012, Jim and Sandy headed out to celebrate their 32nd wedding anniversary. Now, their actual wedding anniversary was on the 12th of December, but Sandy, she's a bit ill that day, so they pushed it by like a week and a half. So, for the big anniversary, they decided to go to their favorite Mexican restaurant, Los Cucos. They chowed down, leaving at about 9.05 p.m. Then the couple headed home. On the way, they went into a CVS to pick up some mixers, Coke and Sprite. And then they arrived home. Uh, now, what happened after that? We don't exactly know, I, I, surprisingly I wasn't there, but whatever happened was pretty disturbing. The next day, on the 23rd of December, at about 4.30pm, Herman, Jim, Jim Melgar's brother, Herman and his family puffed by uh, Sandy and Jim's. It was, you know, it was a few days before Christmas, they planned to have a big old family get together. So, Herman rocked up and knocked on the front door, but got no answer, which he thought was odd, you know, they had a pre-planned Christmas thingy-majig. He then popped around the back. No dice. Now, the garage door was open, so he then entered the house via the garage door, let his family in through the locked front door, and then they heard Sandy calling for help. Sandra Melgar was screaming. They rushed into the master bathroom, where they found a chair wedged under the closet doorknob. Herman moved the chair and opened up the door, and inside they found Sandy laying face down on the ground, her arms tied up behind her back with what seemed to be a bathrobe belt, her ankles bound by a scarf. The binds on her were so tight she had to be cut loose, they couldn't be undone. Herman and his wife Maria, when they discovered Sandy, they would later say it was, you know, it was so absolutely tight, there is no way she could have done it by herself. We're gonna get to that later. Once Sandra was free, she rushed out to find Jim, and she found him in his closet. No pulse. Jim was stabbed and cut 31 times, and had multiple blunt force trauma injuries as well. His legs were tied with a telephone cord, and a rope was loosely tied around his chest. It looked like he had been fighting with his attacker, before they somehow overpowered him, 
and stabbed him to death in the closet. Inside the closet was Jim's gun, but it hadn't been used. At this point, Sandra is just hysterical, you know, uh, as he would be. And the murder weapon, the knife, was found inside the jacuzzi that was inside their home. Also, in the jacuzzi were towels and a blouse. The knife had come from the Melgar home. Paramedics arrived on the scene first, and in the midst of bawling over her husband, Sandra would tell the paramedics that the left side of her head was sore, and her joints, they were also stiff and sore. She would say it's the feeling she would have after she had a seizure. Now, Sandra Woods was known to have seizures. She hadn't had one in a while, but she was familiar with, you know, the aftermath of one. The police arrived, and, you know, first impressions was, looked like a burglary gone wrong, some kind of home invasion. I mean, uh, drawers were open, stuff was left out. Seemed to have been just a horrible, some kind of attack, you know? The EMS personnel found no bruising or laceration on her head and also found no wounds or marks on Sandra's wrists and ankles, though she was apparently tied up for 12 to 14 hours, and the ties had to be cut off due to the fact they were so strongly bound. Sandra then, she wanted to go to hospital, uh, but once she arrived at the hospital, uh, she changed her mind, and she actually had to sign a document saying she refused treatment. Now, she didn't refuse treatment. It's just the way the document was worded. She just, she thought she just didn't need any. And Sandra was then viewed by the investigators. I didn't take a picture of my uh, thing. It was tied also. Okay, we'll get to that here in a second. From the get go, they used interrogation techniques. The room, it was cold. How are you feeling? Freezing. The seating, straight out of the books. From Jump Street, she was viewed with suspicion. I know how it looks. But I was also tied up, and there's, I couldn't, that's just. See, that what we're seeing there, the physical evidence that's there, and what you're telling us, is just not adding up, Sandra. Sandra then told them what happened the night before. Or what she remembers, at least. Sandra told them that a car was tailgating them after leaving CVS, but then when they were getting close to home, they turned right and the other car turned left. I think when we left CVS, there was a, a car following us because when we came in our neighborhood, it was still behind us and he was really close. And I had to go, I'd get upset with him because he, he would drive slower to, when someone was tailgating him and I'd tell him don't do that because, you know, it's dangerous. So, um, but the guy turned left and we turned right, and so we thought it was just a coincidence. And so they arrived home that night. Going into the house via the garage door, they usually kept the front door locked. Now, whether the door in the garage was locked behind them, the garage door and the interior door, we don't know. So, Sandra and Jim get naked into the jacuzzi and enjoy a nice few sips. They were in there for about two hours, talking about, well, anything and everything. Their plans for the future, as Jim was due to retire in about five months. They wanted to sell Sandra's car, they wanted to travel, they talked about their daughter, and they made love while in the jacuzzi. Now, at one point, after being in there for about two hours, they heard their dogs barking outside. They had four, uh, four small dogs. Jim got out of the jacuzzi to let the dogs in. Sandy stayed in the jacuzzi for a few more minutes, and when Jim wasn't returning, she eventually got out herself. She went into the bathroom closet, put on some nightwear, started putting on some lotion, and then, that's it. She blacked out. It was taking a while, so I got out and was gonna get dressed for a change in my closet. And I went in there and I started to change. And that's all I remember until I woke up. The next thing she remembered, she's in the closet. She can't move. And she was sore all over. Her head hurt. And she eventually fell back to sleep. 
She was in there for about 14 hours before her brother-in-law found her. And so you can see how this is kind of a tricky crime scene. And I'll be upfront and honest with you, there's some things that don't add up in your story. But let's get into some evidence, shall we? There was no sign of forced entry into the house, and they find her story, oh, she just blacked out. Frankly, unbelievable. They question the fact that her husband, brutally murdered in the same house while Sandra was just unharmed, just tied up. They were in the jacuzzi, they hear the dogs yapping away, Jim gets out. About maybe 15 minutes later, Sandra's like, where's Jim? She gets out of the jacuzzi too, goes into the closet, and then blacks out. So somebody killed Jim, Sandra didn't hear anything, and then they somehow snuck up on her too, and like whacked her in the back of the head. No, you didn't hear nobody screaming, and you could hear dogs barking outside, but you can't hear no, somebody screaming before. inside. No. You know how close that that room is to where you were, no. and you can't I hear somebody heard, screaming. I heard the dogs because they were probably right, I think they were outside the like where the window of the bathroom is, but I didn't hear anything after that. And the jacuzzi was still going. And actually, I don't even remember hearing the dogs. My husband's the one that says he's got better hearing than I, but I heard the dogs whining afterwards. If he encountered something that would do what we see there, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear something. And if that something is coming into the same room where you're at mm -hmm. to either knock you out or even encounter you, yeah. you're going to hear something. I don't care if you've got a tank cranked up in that bathroom with you. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear something when somebody encounters somebody that's stabbing somebody I wish I had, but I that didn't. violently that many times. You're going to hear that. Jim was stabbed and cut 31 times and had multiple blunt force trauma injuries as well. He had serious injuries to internal organs, damage to his skull, brain and facial bones. He had a lot of defensive wounds on both his hands too. He put up a fight. This wouldn't have been something you'd miss because you were daydreaming, but one thing was that the jacuzzi was on. Must have been a hell of a loud jacuzzi to drown out what must have been an awful racket. Okay, so then if you know, if you find that story to be unbelievable, what's what's the other option? Liz, Sandra's daughter, you know, she didn't live with her parents, but you know, she obviously rushed to Houston after this happened. She would say her mother couldn't hold on to things. She dropped things a lot. She was stiff. She had rheumatoid arthritis. At one point in her life, she was confined to a wheelchair. Sandra could only have done what happened to Jim with great difficulty. And the way, you know, with the health issues she had and just the way she was. She had no cuts, wounds, bruising that would come from, you know, um, attacking and overpowering a larger adult. She had nothing on her, while in contrast, Jim had numerous bruises, abrasions, and catastrophic damage to organs that would indicate a very violent struggle, including fractured eye sockets. A woman of Sandy's size, 5 foot 4, 53 years old, and with her health issues, it would be very unlikely she could overpower her husband without suffering any injuries to herself. Sandra would say she hit her head, or was hit on the head by the intruder, intruders possibly, and that she had an epileptic seizure, and that's what caused the blackout. Which, according to her previous neurologist, was entirely likely. When you do have a major motor seizure, everything goes into spasms. So it's, it's not unusual for a person to ache all over their body. And if one has a seizure, it's also not uncommon to be accompanied by a loss of memory. Jim got out of the jacuzzi because the dogs were barking, so they could hear the dogs barking but couldn't hear a struggle 30 feet away. And another thing is that they had, you know, their next door neighbor. They, Jim and Sandy lived in a one story house. Their next door neighbor lived in a two story house. And the next door's neighbor bedroom overlooked, overlooked basically their backyard. 
And so they had four dogs. The Melgars had four dogs. They were small dogs. They would yap and yap and yap away into the wee hours of the night. The neighbor would bitch and moan about these dogs. They were that annoying. And the neighbor would also say they didn't hear dogs barking that night at all. And they were, you know, they barked a lot. Sandy said she thinks Jim was headed into his closet as he kept a gun in there. That's where he was found. Now, she didn't know exactly where he kept his gun, but she, you know, knowing Jim, she thought he wouldn't have kept it in his safe. I think he was trying to go for the gun. Sorry. 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 Where does he keep the gun? In the closet. What kind of gun? It's just a Beretta. A pistol? Do you know where he keeps it in that closet? No. I wanted him to keep it in the safe, but... I don't know. 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 So, if he was going into his closet to get the gun, you know, did he not have time to use it? Or what if he... He did have time to use it, he just didn't want to use it on whoever was attacking him. It's a possibility. So, there are just so many discrepancies in this case. And there are a lot more, but to the prosecution this was straightforward. I mean, take this for example. You'll see it's pretty darn easy to tie yourself up and lock yourself in a room with a chair. So therefore, Lads, this is pretty clear cut. Well, I'm convinced. She killed her husband and made it look like a burglary and then tied herself up exactly as you see there. Well, that's what the two detectives investigating, they came to that conclusion pretty quickly and then they essentially just worked backwards from there. They would marshal all evidence around that theory that Sandra was responsible and it was a staged scene. One of the things which led to this conclusion was Sandra's refusal to take a polygraph, saying at the time she was too nervous, she was shaking, she was cold, and she didn't want it used against her. What's your, what's your explanation though? What's your excuse for not taking one? It's not holding water, Sandra. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It's not. You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm just being upfront and honest with you. And that's what I'm, that's my job to do that. I just don't want to take it and then it's used against me. That's because, not possible. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Which is fair. They asked her to take this polygraph, you know, not long after the event happened. You know, she would have been shocked. She would have been, you know, this and that. But hey, only guilty people refuse to take a polygraph. Right? What do you think should happen to the person that if we catch that did this to your husband, what, what do you think his punishment or her punishment should be? Do you think they should get a second chance? No. What no. do you think should happen to him or her? They should go to prison. Isn't that what they normally do? They go to prison? <laughs> Burglary and, and then homicide be construed as a capital murder. It could be death penalty. Think they should get the death penalty? Yeah. Yeah. I have no problem with the death penalty. I think it certainly serves a purpose. Did you stage that at your house, ma'am? Stage it? Yeah. Did you did you plan this? No. No, I did not. Would you tell me if you did? I wouldn't even know where to start to stage it. Well, isn't it ironic that you could you you black out at the exact time when he's getting stabbed and bludgeoned? I don't have an answer for you. Could you hear him yelling for help? No. Could you hear him sc screaming? I didn't hear him. When I mean, he was in pain, we know that he suffered a lot. I need you to help me. I need you to help me. I need you to help me on this. Can you help me? I need you to help me. Sandra, I need help. 
Please help me, Sandra. Sandra, help me. Sandra, I need help. I didn't I hear help. anything. Just stop already. I need help, Sandra. I need help. Help me. That's it. That's it. I, I, I need a lawyer. I, I'm not talking anymore because you guys are just trying to torture me here. The investigators actually wanted to charge her with the murder right there and then but the district attorney refused, citing lack of evidence. It would be a year and a half later that they would go ahead, during the summer of 2014, that murder charges were filed against Sandra Melgar. Well, what a development here. A woman who once claimed to be the victim of a home invasion that ended up killing her husband is now charged with his murder. You may remember this story. Christmas Eve of 2012, Sandra Melger claimed somebody broke into her Northwest Harris County home, tied her up in the closet, and murdered her husband. Well, now authorities say that was all an elaborate lie. Ms. Melgar says that uh, they were in the bathroom together, uh, her and her husband, uh, at approximately uh, 1 a.m. this morning, and at some time she blacked out and next thing she remembers is waking up in the closet tied up. Sandra Melgar told police she and her husband Jamie were attacked inside their home. Her husband fatally stabbed. She tied up for 12 hours. You know, it just seemed like something was really strange with how it all came down with, with uh, them being tied up and just one person being killed. A year and a half later, 54-year-old Sandra Melgar is charged with her husband's murder. Court documents revealing he was stabbed with a knife. We were wondering, I mean, it was so weird that uh, what happened and how it happened, nothing was, didn't seem like we heard anything, like anything had been stolen or anything like that. Now curious neighbors want to know what information led investigators to charge Mrs. Melgar and why it took so long. They have, after all, been unnerved for over a year, thinking a home invasion on their street was the work of ruthless thieves. It's a relief to know that it's not a random, you know, it's not a home invasion. The case finally went to trial in 2017. And this is when we learn a lot more. The defense brought in an expert witness, Billy Belk, who was a homicide detective with the Houston Police Department for over 22 years and personally investigated well over 500 murder cases. He went to the crime scene, heard how loud the jacuzzi was, went into the closets, examined all pieces of evidence. Based upon his experiences and his analysis of the case, he spoke of just how bad the investigation was. First of all, the EMS personnel, you know, who arrived at the scene uh, were never questioned. Uh, Herman Melgar and his wife, the people who discovered Sandra Melgar and were first on the scene, they were never questioned again. Which you think you might want to ask them a couple of follow-up questions, being the first people to discover it, but ah, don't worry, don't bother, be grand. In fact, many longtime friends of the Melgars were never interviewed, which you think maybe they should have been to get an idea of their marriage. The detectives wrote that the doors into the house, there were locked. You know, so therefore, no forced entry, right? So therefore, Sandra must have been the one to do it. Except, how did Herman Melgar get into the house then? And people, regular people, visitors to the house would say that door was never locked. Liz, Jim and Sandra's daughter, was asked by the police to provide a list as to what was missing from the home. If this was a burglary, wink wink. She told them a TV was gone, and this information was ignored by the police. What was also ignored by the cops was a backpack Liz found in the garage. It was under the Melgar car. The backpack was from inside the home, and inside was jewelry, an Xbox, some video games, and DNA was found on these items. Women's DNA, not Sandra Melgar's DNA. The same unknown woman's DNA was found inside the house as well, on jewellery boxes. In January, weeks after the incident, Sandra recovered parts of her memory, and she remembered a young Hispanic woman during the attack. She said she was in her early to mid-twenties, wearing a dark red or burgundy blouse. And she looked angry, and she was talking to a person who was tying Sandra up who was behind 
Sandra. Now, Sandra didn't mention this to the police, obviously, at the time, as, you know, she didn't remember. And over time, she would say, you know, it's possible that she could regain some of her memories over time, which, which is possible. But to the police, it was like, Pah, full of shit. In the closet where Jim was found, there was a safe. The handle of that safe was all bloody. That handle of the safe was never processed by the crime scene investigators. Because when they were asked, you know, maybe you should have a look at it, do some forensic bullshit. They were like, ah, oh, no, sure, it's, it would have been Sandra's. It would have been Sandra Melgar's, you know, DNA and fingerprints we would have found on it. So we never bothered, never bothered to look at it. You know, case closed already. The police also found an unknown man's DNA on the scarf that was used to tie Sandra up. They also found it on the door handles in the master bedroom, backpack in the garage, and on just general doorknobs around the house. That DNA did not fit anyone in the Melgar family, but to the police... Ah, don't worry about it. Not long after the incident happened, a local news station was reporting on the case, and a reporter told police that they saw a suspicious person at the crime scene outside the Melgar home, whose name was Chad Ryan Sullivan. When asked, he told the news reporter he lived, you know, in the local area, hence why he was there, just rubbernecking. The reporter said he was acting strange. Upon checking him in the police system, it turned out he was a thief and had a history of assault and who was also just out of jail on bond two days prior to Jim's death. At one point, you know, the lead investigator paid this Chad a visit. You know, gotta be seen to be, you know, at least entertaining all possibilities. Twice in the same day, at 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. to be exact, they popped by his home and got no answer from him. They then left their business card to be contacted by Chad Sullivan, and that was the last time they ever bothered to try contact him. So yeah, that's a lot of information there. You know, on one hand, you have an investigation that seems like tunnel vision. There's a lot of things here which would point to Sandra being innocent. I mean, basically, on the other hand, you have Sandra not even being capable of doing what happened. Okay, so then, what about the primary thing in, you know, most murder cases, motive? What was the motive? Why would Sandra do this if she was even capable of doing it? Which I don't think she was. Sandra had some bruising on her upper arm. During the interrogation, the detectives said it looked like wraparound bruising. And that's when the detectives told Sandra that in their opinion, there are two types of murderers. One that would just kill you on the street in cold blood, and two, the one who is being pushed into murder by being triggered, like through an argument. We work hundreds and hundreds of murders. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Sometimes we we work cold-blooded killers mm -hmm. that just on the street that would just kill somebody for nothing. Okay. Then sometimes we work murders that they're in an argument and something happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's two different types of people. You understand? Because if you argue with somebody and you lose it, yeah. your temper and an argument That's happens. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. And I think I'm going to stop talking now because I think I'm going to need a lawyer because I know how this works. I was the only one in the house, so I, of course. Who else would be in the house? No one would have. That I know of, no one. The police checked neither Jim nor Sandra were having any affairs. They went through their phone calls, messages, emails, search history. The couple had no financial problems either. So why would Sandra possibly want to murder her husband of over 32 years? Well, the prosecution had a couple of theories. Ones which they pulled out of their hole. The prosecutor argued one of the motives for the murder was that Sandra wanted out of their marriage. But as a Jehovah's Witness, a divorce would leave Sandra shunned. The only way to stay part of the community and to leave Jim at the same time was to murder him and then stage the crime to not be found out. The other motive? Yes. Come on, you know, you know, you know, I know you know it. Life insurance policy. Jim had a big ol' life insurance policy. One that was like set up a decade earlier. Now, both of these motives, and all motives really, are kind of just speculation. No, there's no proof. 
I'm not kidding. They just pulled it, as I said, out of their hole. The prosecutor also brought up the idea that Sandra lured Jim into letting her tie up his legs with the telephone cords as part of some kind of sex game, and then took him by surprise using a large knife to stab him to death. The idea of this, you know, lovely, uh, middle-aged, religious couple having like a kinkier side is one that was grabbed onto pretty quickly. There were some sex toys found under the pillow of their bed, ones which Sandra would say, you know, was given to them as a joke. The jury questioned how Sandra's story was changing, and they all agreed at the end of the day that her story just didn't make sense. They said that the murder scene was too elaborate for an intruder to do it. It seemed like maybe the most likely motive would be sexual, sexual play. Sexual game gone wrong, even. And, you know, aside from Sandra's story being kind of a bit iffy, there were a number of things which the prosecution was like, look at this, this is proof. For one, the crime scene was staged. The drawers were pulled out, but not thrown across the room. Some detectives who worked in the burglary division said that it didn't look like a real burglary scene. Sandra's bag and purse were left on top of the bed. Her credit cards were left inside. But then again, uh, the TV was gone, prescription drugs were gone, and uh, Jim's billfold, money from Jim's billfold and money from Sandra's purse were gone. So there were things stolen, the police just didn't care. But also, you know, there was no sign of forced entry. Uh, yeah, there was no forced entry. Because remember Herman Melgar, Jim's brother, who discovered the entire scene, was able to get into the house without kicking down a door. But then there's documentation showing that Sandra, you know, who suffered from seizures, they were, she was getting them under control. She hadn't had one for quite some time. But then again, it's not uncommon for people who have suffered from a concussion to have a seizure. Even people who have never had a seizure before. Blood evidence. There is blood only in the closet and its immediate vicinity. There wasn't any leading out of the closet, you know, like, a, like an intruder might bring with them. But then, you know, if this is pointing towards Sandra, there, there was no clothes anywhere that she could have been wearing while killing Jim, and she had no injuries to her body. The murder weapon. The knife that was used to kill Jim matched the other knives found in the kitchen, so it seems that the attacker came without a weapon. Sandra was not cut, had not bled, none of her blood was found in the house, her DNA was not on Jim, nor was Jim's blood found on her or her clothing. Now, one thing, though, that is important to mention is, remember, there was a blouse found in the jacuzzi, along with some towels, and the knife was found there as well. Well, blood splatter was found on that blouse. Now, that blouse, it was never checked to see if it was Sandy's, the size of it was never checked to match up with what was in her closet. But that is something for the prosecution. Sandra could have been wearing that blouse, put it into the water in the jacuzzi, along with the knife and the towels, to try and wipe away any evidence. It's definitely something worth mentioning. Chemical processing also established that there was no attempt made by Sandra Melgar to clean the sinks, clean the shower, or clean the jacuzzi. No one cleaned up any crime scene. Sandra was a woman with multiple health issues. It's unlikely she could have done it. It's also unlikely that if she did do it, it would have been so easy she wouldn't even get blood on her. During the trial, though, the prosecutors pointed towards a cloudy fingernail on her hand, which they, you know, thought pointed to her having used some kind of cleaning supplies, you know? I mean, I guess it could be nail polish remover either, but uh, who knows? Because of all of this uh, dodgy evidence, um, the police, the prosecution, and the jury believed that Sandra murdered her husband with a knife and then tied herself up to make it look like some kind of staged robbery. In August 2017, Sandra Melgar was found guilty and she was sentenced to 27 years in prison. Her projected release date is 2044. The assistant district attorney said of the judge's ruling, Sandra Melgar hacked the life out of her husband Jamie, and for that she will spend the balance of her life on a cell block. She showed no remorse. The sentence is just. Is it though? When you're finding somebody guilty, isn't it supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt? And I think there's a lot of room for reasonable doubt here. But, um, oh yeah, I forgot. That's just in movies. Real life doesn't work that way. In late 2018, famed attorney Kathleen Zellner took on the Sandra Melgar case. You might remember her from such cases as Stephen Avery or even Ryan Ferguson, which we talked about not so long ago. 
In 2019, the Truth and Justice podcast, which had done a series on this case, announced a $20,000 reward for the real killer of Jamie Jim Melgar, who could still be out there. I think is probably more than likely out there. Sandra Melgar recently appealed, though this was denied. Her family and friends, including her daughter, say they will continue to fight for her innocence. They got it wrong. They, uh, they got it completely wrong. You say you blacked out at the moment your husband was being murdered. I, I but people watching might think, that sounds so convenient. Yeah, it, it's not a blackout. I have seizure, seizures. And uh, I had a lump in my head, so I was hit. And then I went into a seizure, more than likely. I mean, no one was there to actually see it, but that's how it felt like when I woke up. Sandra, did you kill your husband? No, I did not kill my husband. No. Fascinating case. A bizarre one, you know, in which, um, on one hand, you have somebody entering their home and murdering Jim while Sandra didn't hear anything, and then, um, and then, you know, uh, knocking her out and tying her up, which is kind of strange. But then on the other hand, you have Sandra with a lot of evidence to disprove she did it, and that she would even be capable of doing it. As always, please let me know your thoughts on this case in the usual place. If you want to learn more about this case, please check out the link in the description. And thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I will see you, as always, real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.